are who you say you are you'll do what you say you'll do and you'll be who you've always been to us Jesus our hope is in you alone our strength in your mighty name our peace in the darkest day remains Jesus and this we
For the last couple of weeks, we've been following the Apostle Paul as he has been on his missionary journeys, and today we actually pick up the beginning of his third missionary journey, and we find that he ends up in the Asia Minor city of Ephesus, maybe one of the most remarkable stops on anywhere along in Paul's journeys and his mission endeavors. For it was in Ephesus that he stayed the longest amount of time, probably close to three years when his ministry was all said and done. Scripture certainly identifies two years, and maybe there was even more than that that was involved in the time that he spent in Ephesus. And the book of Ephesus that he also wrote is a very powerful section of Scripture, and I trust that... uh, We will all take full advantage of what Paul had to write in that book. We'll be quoting from it a little bit this morning. If you've taken a look at your uh, worship folder, you'll see that uh, there are just a whole number of Scripture passages that I will be using this morning. But I want to make it clear that this is not just going to be a Bible study. I have... It's on my heart that there is a message from God. And I think one of the lines in the song that Jim just sang really speaks to this instance. And that is, I trust that the Lord will speak to us this morning. And may we trust in that. Let's take a look at Acts chapter 19 and let's read the first seven verses together. While Apollos was in Corinth... Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe the one who would come later, meaning Jesus As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other languages and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. I decided to take kind of a old-fashioned approach this morning. I'm labeling it four W's and an H. Who, what, when, how, why. You got it. So you'll know when I'm done. So here we start. Who should receive the Holy Spirit? Well, I want us to be aware that the Holy Spirit is constantly active at all times, in all places, whether we're fully conscious of it at all. When we're speaking of this activity of the Spirit that surrounds us, we are actually speaking of God's prevenient grace. Now, me, that phrase is new to some of you. Some of you have undoubtedly heard it before. But let me take a moment to explain Prevenient grace really means the grace that goes before. In other words, you and I are all experiencing the grace of God even before we ever think about giving our lives to Christ. The grace of God is at work in multiple ways. That is what we call prevenient grace, the grace that goes before There's an ancient image that helps create that point of view in our minds. Uh, Folks used to talk about this a long time ago. They referred to the grace of God as being the hound of heaven. 
In other words, this dog dogged us, chasing after us, pursuing us, relentlessly coming to us at times in our lives so that eventually we would become aware of the fact that there is a grace of God that is reaching out to us all the while. That image stills valid that the grace of God is pursuing us. But that unknown grace is not quite what Paul is driving at in this particular passage of Scripture. Paul is driving at the idea that this Spirit of God not only pursues us and is after us, but he actually indwells us and becomes part of us. And so that is who the Holy Spirit is. This residence of God within us is what God desires more than anything else for us. And that presence becomes an ongoing, continuous relationship that we have with God as a result of the Spirit of God within us. So, Based on what we've just read out of Acts chapter 19, we get the picture that the Spirit is given to those who are believers, followers of Jesus Christ. They've accepted that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God, and that is the root of their faith. They're no longer attached to the world. Jesus actually prayed this for us for all of his disciples. His most extensive prayer that we have recorded in Scripture is found in John's Gospel, chapter 17. And there are just a few verses that I would like to quote from that passage. They, meaning the disciples, know everything you have given me comes from you. I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them, for they are yours. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am not of the world. You get the picture. Jesus is recognizing that his disciples, his followers, have received this word. It is true that the Spirit of God is to dwell within us. And as a result, our orientation is no longer toward the world. It's toward the things of God. So, what does the Holy Spirit do for us anyway? To receive the Holy Spirit means that God has set that person aside for his specific holy and divine purposes. There is a spiritual cleansing that takes place when a person is filled with the Spirit. And the Church of the Nazarene has taken a particular stance on this teaching The word that we use to describe this presence of God within us is the word to be sanctified or sanctification. And throughout John's gospel in chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus explains to his disciples and the passages are there for us to review to find out just exactly what the Holy Spirit will do in a person's life. First of all, he enables us to serve him. Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. They will even do greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Imagine, Christ is telling us that because the Spirit is in our heart and in our life, we will be able to do things that he 
was unable to do. That's an awesome thought. The Holy Spirit also provides comfort and counsel. Jesus teaches, the Father will give you another advocate. That's a name for the Holy Spirit. But that name also means counselor and comforter. And he will be with you forever. He is the Spirit of truth. The Spirit of God will also teach and instruct us and remind us of spiritual truths. Jesus says, the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. All of that means that as a result, you and I will be able to fulfill the command of God in our lives. Let's go on. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I kept, have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love one another as I have loved you. The Holy Spirit in a person's life enables us and empowers us to be a witness for Christ. Jesus goes on, when the advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, he will test about, testify about me and you must also testify for you have been with me from the beginning. The Spirit will prompt and correct people of wrongdoing when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The power and the presence of the Holy Spirit will be our guide. He will bring to us that which is true. He will guide us into all truth. And finally, in this list of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us, he will also provide joy for his followers. Jesus says this, Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Wow. What an incredible presence in our lives we have when the Spirit of God indwells us completely. He enables us to do all of these things and so much more. So the next question is, when does the Holy Spirit come fully and completely into a person's life? It comes with faith. I'm so grateful Jim sang that song about faith before this message because it reminds us how absolutely essential our faith is in all matters that relate to our experience with God. Somewhere in our journey with God, there will be a moment of awakening, a, a dawning, if you want to put it that way, a sense of awareness that there is a spiritual need in our lives. And the only way that that can be satisfied is by the indwelling presence of the Spirit within. How that happens varies from person to person. When those moments may come to you, I have no way of actually identifying that, but you will know it when it happens. Maybe it would help if I told you my story about that. I was a college student. I was between my junior and senior year in college. As a matter of fact, uh, what had taken over my life that junior year of college was my interest in golf. Some of you folks know about that. I had actually made golf my idol. It had become my God. And about 
halfway through that summer break while I was at home and working, my mother came to me and said, John, is your heart right with God? And some of you have heard this part. I said, well, no. And she said, well, how can you go to bed and go to sleep knowing that your heart isn't right with God? And I said, up until now, I've done just fine. But she went to praying for me. About three weeks after that, my father was home. Just the three of us were in the house. And I had that moment that I was describing to you just a little bit ago. I became aware of the fact that my life was on a dead end street and that I had to deal with these spiritual matters that were going on in my life. So I said to my parents, I said, I need to pray and I would like to have you pray with me. And we went into our room and we had a time of prayer. And I asked God to forgive me of the attitude, the direction of my life, the things that I had been doing and recognizing that they were all wrong and I needed to have my life right with God. But the moment I finished with that prayer where I asked God for forgiveness, my background, everything I'd been taught, everything I'd learned, listening to people preach, every church I'd been in and out of, had made me aware of the fact that I could not just ask for forgiveness. I also had to ask to receive the Holy Spirit. I didn't even get up off my knees. I just continued my prayer, not only asking God to forgive me, but I prayed the prayer, O Lord, take my life, take my ambitions, take myself. I give it all to you. And I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, I experienced the infilling presence of the Holy Spirit in that moment. No more than five minutes had passed between my prayer asking God for forgiveness and allowing the Holy Spirit to come in my life. Now I recognize that my story is unique and unusual, but I'm here to tell you this morning that the question that the apostle was asking the people of Ephesus is absolutely crucial. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Some of us will say, I don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit. Others of you will have to say, no, but I need him. And that variation of experience applies to every single one who, of us who is here in this room this morning. A couple of other passages of Scripture highlight the fact that when we become aware of that need, we must seek out the presence of the Holy Spirit within From Ephesians, we hear this. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of goodness, righteousness, and faith. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means a surrender of selfishness and self-willfulness. It is a wholehearted consecration 
and relinquishment of our lives into the will and purposes of God for us. And so now we approach the question of how do we receive the Spirit? We've already said it. We'll say it again. It is only through faith. Just like everything else in our relationship with God, it comes to us as a result of faith. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Jesus spoke these words to the Apostle Paul. I will open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and the from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And Jesus also said, if you, though you are evil, are able to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So why should we receive the Holy Spirit? It's the only way that you and I can be right in the sight of God. He looks for righteousness among his followers and believers. And the only way that you and I can ever enter into that kind of state of being is by being filled with the Spirit. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Christ once for all. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. In other words, what God has done for us through Jesus Christ is the only way that we can ever find the righteousness that God expects of us. The infilling presence of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to fulfill God's desires and intentions for us. In Acts we read, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. You see, only the Spirit of God can satisfy the yearning in a person's heart for inward peace and well-being. Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Spirit. In all reality, it finally comes down to our desperate need for God's grace to be the sufficiency of what we lack in our life and in our soul. It's the only way that we can live in this world and have any hope of eternity. In the long run, it is the Holy Spirit that gives us the confidence and assurance that our eternal destiny is going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Father in heaven, can't help but look at these folks who are here this morning and ask the question that Paul asked of the people that he looked at that day in Ephesus so long ago. 
Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? I pray, dear Lord, that there is people here today that may have heard something about the Holy Spirit that triggers that moment of awareness where they will seek to experience your infilling presence. I pray, dear Lord, that the hound of heaven will be at work among us this morning. May we sense your presence, maybe in a way we have never experienced it before. May there come from deep within us that soulful desire to say, Oh Lord, I want you to live in my life and take complete control of my life. I trust you. I trust your word. I believe in you. And I know that you have a spirit that wants to be within me. Oh, I pray, dear Lord, this morning that there are folks here that are ready to receive your spirit. I ask that you will make yourself known to us this morning. In the name of Jesus, amen. This is a time to come and pray if there's anybody here that needs to receive the Spirit. The Spirit is already here. You can count on it. The presence of God is real. May we find that His Spirit will come and fill our lives even now. If you need to come and pray this morning, you're more than welcome to do so.
that I cannot know till I cross that narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach.